first, we're interested in collectives. And to be clear, we're not using this word in any kind of historical context, uh, but simply using it to describe groups of people, objects, or actions. Collectives serve as both models of social engagement and formal strategies within the work. Uh, we like projects that invite a certain kind of spontaneous interaction, um, which is a kind of difficult alchemy, actually. And we also like generating collections of related forms with a high level of informality. So much of the recent work we're sharing today is part of a growing catalog of projects in the form of fields, aggregations, hybrids, and composites that can be read as elaborations of systems uh, or kind of like games with relatively primitive parts. And the openness of this work is not necessarily any kind of deferment of authorship. In fact, it's an acknowledgment of the impossibility of the absolute. So the inherent dynamism of these open works allows us to remain flexible uh, through change of conditions, and we'll elaborate on that. Um, we each have personal research passions, and our practice is shaped by their composite. Um, as a young practice, we're interested in generating rich environments through a careful and often necessary economy of forms and methods. This often means using the shelf material systems and components, or generating novel designs by combining elements in a unique way. The act of collecting requires some discernment or an act of curation. We are not historians, but we love history. Um, we're not anthropologists, but we love culture. We're not coders, but we love computers. Uh, instead, we are designers, and we believe that designers have the unique ability um, and, and capability to absorb influences and transform them into new works. Um, and finally, we're interested in collections. So creating a collection means uh, generating uh, meaning between objects, often when their relationship is not immediately evident. So if you've ever seen an architect's personal library, for example, uh, much can be learned in the way that they see the world based on how they organize their books, by color, by topic, by time period, by geography. Um, the same might be true when we think about cataloging our own collection of work. Um, collections invite questions of framing, scope, and organizing. So in this world of like easy access to incredible amounts of data and content, Collections are the kind of contemporary medium through which we practice to try to generate bodies of work, and we'll elaborate on that. And as we share this collection of work today, we should note that it's often hardest to categorize your own work. Um, so we don't often actually talk about our name out post office, um, but in this context, it seemed really appropriate to do so. Um, we chose the name of our firm actually after moving to Germany, after an influential year of living and working in Ukraine. And for us, the word outpost has two meanings. Um, living in an outpost means that you're disconnected in some way from your typical world, a routine, daily life, or architectural community. Um, this might seem like a disadvantage, like you're in the rear guard, but actually this disengagement comes with much freedom. Um, the freedom of time and space to work and experiment. And we often felt this freedom while we were working in Ukraine. You have the feeling in an outpost that no one is watching you so that you can try new things that you might not be bold enough to try otherwise. The other way that we think about the word outpost is actually that an outpost um, is also the point most forward, um, the front line or the avant-garde as used in the original French military terms. And this meaning um, of the term outpost represents our goal to push knowledge forward, to seek out new places, new inspirations, new contexts, and new collaborators. This is what brought us to Ukraine in the first place. In an outpost, you can really belong to no place or simultaneously two places at once, which we often do. Although our firm is now based in the US, we attempt to maintain this dual perspective of both being an outsider and an insider. Our firm is based in the middle of the country, in the Midwest, um, where we can draw inspiration from both the East Coast and the West Coast architectural communities. Um, so we've chosen a few projects today to share more in depth um, that will highlight some of these themes and also talk about our evolution as a practice. So actually one of the first collaborations that we ever did together was a competition to design the Maidan Memorial after the Revolution of uh, Dignity in 2014. So this was the Heavenly Hundred competition, which I don't think I need to elaborate for this audience. Um, the project was important to us for a number of reasons, because uh, it dealt directly with, with uh, events we had witnessed ourselves in Ukraine, and although we experienced them very much as outsiders, so that was important. Um, because of this, we approached the project with a certain degree of naivete, uh, but we tried to leverage our knowledge of Ukrainian culture with an outsider's point of view. Again, we're thinking in the context of being in an outpost, both a part of something and being directly outside it. 
Uh, architecturally speaking, we were interested in the project because it allowed us to consider the spontaneous collectives of people, audiences, and the vibrant street light of Kiev before and after the revolution. And I should say that that competition was thrown together so quickly, it actually really benefited us because we worked on it while we were still in Ukraine. So it, it, this kind of became the, the kind of end of our experience here in, in some ways that, that first year. So for this design, there were two important factors to consider. The first was that the composition of the occupiers that lost their lives at Maidan was not homogenous. They were young, they were old, they were from uh, different parts of Ukraine and even other neighboring nations. And the second part was that the movement itself was an incomplete project, something that was uh, acknowledged from the very beginning, and the memorial we felt should reflect that. And it was clear from the competition brief that it was a strong desire to break from traditional figural statues and memorials which depict specific figures and to make the monument part of the street a space integrated into the public realm. And for us, we even wanted to establish a new public realm. So the proposal was really simple. A colonnade of 104 slender columns supporting a new public garden. At the street level, the monument elevates and provides new vistas to the Maidan. And below, the space echoes the ad hoc bunkers constructed on the street with a slowly rising wall which documents the history of the, of the movement. So that kind of retaining wall behind the memorial would document the story. Each column fe uh, features the name of one of the victims, and several additional columns represent unknown victims. So the organization begins with a hypostyle hall, a typology that emphasizes simultaneously continuity and the individual spatial unit. This typology represents the spirit of the collective, the most important quality of the movement for us. And while the traditional hypostyle is spatially uniformed, we want to acknowledge and articulate again that this group was a multivalent collective, a diverse set of people united briefly at a critical moment in history. So in the reflected ceiling plan, you can see the figuration of these skylight voids. Uh, the structure unifies at the roof and is inscribed in a circle. It creates a really strong figure, but at the same time, um, it's ragged in its edge, suggesting the incompleteness of both the monument and the movement. Again, trying to oscillate between something that's kind of frozen and complete, but yet feels expansive and part of something larger, kind of clipped uh, out of a larger fabric. So the iconic status of that incomplete figure simultaneously allows for a reading of discrete object and a broader continuous field. So the vaulting unifies column, sky, and skylight as one single expression, creating new experiential possibilities, opening views to the memorial, and offering opportunities to gather in the hall. It's a kind of mediation on infinite versus discrete within the hall below. We wanted the form to feel spiritual, but reflective of the open and inclusive society that Ukrainians desire, not focusing on any one religion. So the project has two faces, one that memorializes the protesters and those they left behind, which is this view, and one which looks the other way, from the public garden toward a future view of the new Maidan Square. In the end, the project became precisely about the collision between somber reflective moments and the optimisms and ambitions of a, a Brazilian nation. Um, so the next project we're gonna talk about, Safety Not Guaranteed, was um, one of the first projects um, after we moved back to um, the US after living in Germany for a year. Um, so after I conducted my initial research on castles and fortifications in Western Ukraine, um, I started to really consider how we might think about defensive architecture in the contemporary context. Um, we're not typically building castles today, um, but we are certainly building defensive architecture and structures. Um, so specifically, I turned next to the American context um, to think about the vast expanses of suburbia um, as new informal defensive settlements. And as the Walter B. Sanders Fellow in Architecture at the University of Michigan, this design research project and exhibition brought together several um, of our combined research themes, including this pro proliferation of the American suburbs, the impact of digital surveillance and defense on architecture, and American typologies of the everyday landscape. Architecture is not inseparable from defense, as its most primitive architecture is defense against an environment. For hundreds of years, defensive civic architecture for wealthy sovereigns drove the discipline through the design and construction of countless fortresses, castles, palaces, villas, and city walls. The design and construction of these defense systems was among the favored topics of early architectural treatises, as shown here. Thus, from its most primitive and revered origins, architecture was rehearsed in environments of conflict. We're interested in the way that architectures of defense historically have operated through a set of mathematical principles and geometric parameters which evolve as responses to technology. 
These systems allow us to compare historic forms of contemporary context with an eye towards the implementation and development of new forms. During the research phase of this project, we were interested in cataloging and identifying aesthetic or material properties of defense systems. From border walls to suburban bollards, architecture is being asked to perform tasks which transform social issues into design problems. Rather than solve these problems, our research focused on the formal and spatial implications of defense typologies and on their material composition. Through a series of architectural drawings of smart objects, for example, um, we started to no notice similarities um, between the design of Apple products, smart piggy banks, webcams, and surveillance equipment. Um, rounded corners and white or pastel colors um, sort of elicit uh, friendly feelings toward the user. In contrast, um, objects designed to deter, to deter crime or scare people um, were designed quite differently even when they're performing the exact same functions. So here we're just looking at the kind of power of design itself um, as a, almost a kind of marketing tool. Um, the first phase of the research was then compiled into a book um, which included text, drawings, photographs, as well as um, contributions from other architectural writers and critics. The research looked at a variety of scales from the global to the personal, um, considering the vastness of this topic and embracing a kind of frenetic method of information gathering and collection, again, collection. Um, the research included a series of case studies, um, drawings of specific buildings. Um, so shown on the left is a section which highlights the design of the new World Trade Tower, um, where the first 13 floors are completely unoccupiable due to s security concerns on the left. You see the original, and on the right of that page, you see um, the new tower. Um, in, in addition to examples from architectural history, we're also interested in universal forms of representation which have historically been linked to architecture. Um, so the history of the model became a precedent in a way. Um, so the image on the left shows a contemporary model um, where US Marines are using a sand table, um, a type of ad hoc modeling um, to explain an upcoming mission. Um, on the right, the images of a photograph of, from World War II, a model actually by Norman Bel Geddes, which was used to visualize specific battles for the public um, through an exhibition and then photographed in Life magazine. So the model being made only a year after um, the battle, and it was actually about kind of education of the public. And so uh, looking here at the power of the architectural model to convey information not only to architects, but actually to a much broader audience. Um, so other forms of representation were also studied from the literal staging of false homes during World War II, as the example on the left, um, or also digital obfuscation found on Google Earth to protect certain military sites. These images highlight architecture's unique ability um, to visualize spaces and landscapes. Um, as a representational device, the physical model is still one of the most valued forms of communication. Um, and in, inherent to the physical model, um, it allows the viewer to immerse themselves into an architectural project. Um, so when we created the design project for this, um, based on this research, um, the model became incredibly important. So three models were made, which drew specific inspiration in content and the representation, representation from historical precedents. So on right, kind of contemporary sand, uh, sand model, and on the left, the section model. In order to offer a specific design proposition on the topic of defense and architecture, we located the project in the American suburb. Suburbs offer a way to understand the plurif plurif proliferation of a typological system across vast landscapes and also local variations um, which respond to social or economic conditions. Fortification in the suburbs occurs at the scale of the front door, the home, the cul-de-sac, the neighborhood. More and more suburbs are forms of enclaves which heavily screen their visitors through the uses of gates, fences, checkpoints, or surveillance equipment. This project envisions a future for the American suburb, um, one where density and hyperarticulation of vernacular types create a new domestic typology. Through the appropriation of domestic forms, colors, and materials, the project attempts to mask itself between critique and design proposition. The aggregation of the gable roof form became an important formal language for the project, in addition to the digital camouflage pattern, which was scaled to suggest the materiality of bricks. The uniformity of the houses, both in the models and in the panorama projections, highlight the desire to blend in in the suburbs. Through their coding restrictions or at only times through social pressure, suburbs encourage conformity. They allow inhabitants to camouflage themselves behind a particular socioeconomic status, or in many instances, reinforce social divisions. 
Environmental improvements may only be scratching the surface of the architectural opportunities of the suburbs as they're unsustainable in a variety of ways, including political, social, and economic. Okay, so this next project we'll talk about is a little bit in a different tone. It's a <laughs> bit of a fun diversion for us that's actually expanded into a, a pretty substantial piece of research. So we've been typing drawings with ASCII characters for the last few years. So ASCII characters are basically just like the characters in your keyboard, but there's actually 256 of them. Um, and it started as a kind of diversion because um, uh, I couldn't sleep uh, and became a kind of compulsion. So we even made a book and had an exhibition. So amidst the daily digital excesses we were going through, an 8-bit architecture seemed a suitably extraneous response. Um, so we h use um, the expected precedents for this kind of work. So we think of like Arcazoom's No Stop City typewriter plans. Uh, Annie Albers has these extraordinary preparatory studies for weaving that she did in a typewriter. And our favorite concrete poets like uh, Hans Jörg Meyer. And so what we find compelling about all these drawings, which are completely just composed of uh, letters and punctuation, is the methodological transcription from a source image to a scaleless syntax. So you take a representation and you have to figure out how to encode it. We type the plans in a uh, notepad, which is making it probably the lowest software possible for architecture. Um, but it's actually a decidedly specific medium. Uh, some drawings copy paste well and others are just impossible. Rendering a drawing through ASCII involves discrete decisions about resolution, character selection, and legibility. Um, and the for while the uh, string of data is just 8-bit code, essentially, the formatting generates recognizable analog images. So the question about these is, are they images or are they text? Are they drawings or diagrams? Another way to ask the question might be, do drawing ASCII drawings communicate character or type? And this is something we've been kind of thinking a lot about. Um, the drawings delineate principles and rules through encoded patterns, such as our drawings of the uh, Parthenon or Pantheon, but at other moments they reveal character. They hold a kind of immediate visual effect. They illustrate sensation, and like our ASCII drawings of the five orders, they should be read as images. So the question is, after producing all these drawings, what to do with them? So once we had kind of generated this library, we did it over a period of half a year, we would basically type one of these plans every day it was time to do our own writing. So we searched for a way to leverage this silly catalog, and we actually turned to Peronese and his uh, Compomartio etchings. So in the Compomartio etchings, uh, uh, Peronese freely recombines fragments with little or no regard for historical or archeological accuracy. If you guys know the drawings, um, they appear quite, uh, they appear as if they're documenting, they appear quite authoritative, but of course they're completely made up. Um, the code draws from the library of plans we generated and then begins to combine them, as you see unfolding in this animation, into a potentially infinite pattern. It leverages the historical plans to suggest impossible and fantastical situations. At the same time, it destabilizes the order and totality of the original fragments. So in a way, the project, which we've termed another compromartio, hints at the possibility of engaging with history through code and ultimately it manifests the useless machine that Tafuri saw when he read Peronese's etchings and wrote about them. So the thing could go on forever. We even programmed a dot matrix printer in a gallery to just spit out this pattern uh, for hours at a time. We, we uh, had an exhibition in Chicago, and what was fantastic about this particular venue is it's actually on the street, and half the people in this photo are just people that were walking by. And what's amazing about this is that actually, if you're talking about the Campo Marzio, if you're drawing plans from ASCII's, of course, everyone knows that out of all the architectural drawings, the plan is probably the least accessible to a layperson. People were stopping in their tracks and were very, very curious about the project and could explain it to us almost instantly. And that was really exciting to us because otherwise it's a really boring disciplinary project. But it opened a kind of question about how can we make these things more accessible. People liked them because it reminded them of early video games. It felt like 8-bit stuff they had played on Atari. Um, but at the same time, they were actually able to recognize a lot of the plans as well. So we had these booklets and people could browse through them and they started finding plans within uh, this larger pattern of things that they had never really seen before and it evoked a certain sense of wonder. Uh, and we had these, yeah, these booklets that served as a kind of library of the archive.
If you want to know more about it, um, the project actually just got published a couple days ago on Columbia University's Books and Architecture in the City project called Avery Shorts. So Avery Shorts is 500 words. Uh, they mail them out to you uh, once a week, and it's short pieces by architects and critics and writers. We think they're really interesting. Ours is interesting also, but um, everyone should, uh, should subscribe to that. So now we're going to talk about a couple of projects that have recently been um, built. So Intermission was the competition winning design for a storefront exhibition and environment um, celebrating the work of a philanthropic NGO um, named People's Liberty in Cincinnati, Ohio. The organization awards grants to community activists, artists, and leaders and wanted a space to celebrate the first two and a half years of their five-year mission. Um, the organization focuses on outreach into the community, and they wanted an installation that would bring awareness to the work that they do. So given the gallery's location, our site um, was on the ground floor and had a really large storefront window to the street. So the exhibition was organized to draw visitors from the street um, and sidewalk through, throughout the entire space, um, using a series of overlapping elements. In the spirit of public performance and celebration, our proposal utilized elements of a traditional theater, so we looked at lighting, curtains, and the proscenium wall, and reorganized them into an immersive, non-hierarchical landscape of neon colors and images. Uh, the design turned a backstage party um, into a public celebration. The three sliding fields of seating, curtains, and neon lights lock into the strict grid, um, but the viewer seems to to, but to the viewer, they seem to float more randomly. Um, the gallery bounds the, ex the elements, but continue to imply a larger field which would extend outside the boundary of the gallery. The client wanted the gallery space to feel um, or to be used for a variety of activities beyond just an installation, so we designed several scenarios um, against which we could test these needs. The flexible curtain and furniture system could be rapidly deployed in a host of configurations, allowing the organization to keep the installation up for several months um, while hosting workshops, talks, lunches, and other events in the space. Again, drawing reference from some of our previous work, elements of this design, specifically the curtains, allowed us to move um, explore moving digital techniques back into the physical world. So the exhibition content itself was printed directly on curtains, combining the content delivery um, with the spatial organization. So allowing the user to manipulate the environment um, while manually scrolling through the exhibition rather than having a series of um, touch screens or some digital, we wanted to actually move that digital into the physical world. So this allowed us to combine content and interaction of the visitor into a single action. So with a few simple moves, the space transforms from a large open gallery to a series of small rooms. As you move back into the space, the color gradient transforms um, and tells you information about grantees and projects and impacts. Images are printed at a variety of scales so that um, some required the visitor to stand very far away and others need to be read very closely. The physical nature of the project allowed us to work on several types of materials at once. So to create neon elements, we worked with the local Cincinnati fabricator um, to create these modular benches. They are cut from EPS foam supplied by a boating manufacturer um, and cut on a robot. Um, they were also finished in Michigan working with an automotive coating system that's used for um, pickup truck bed liners. So as our office was responsible for both the design, fabrication, and installation of the project, and we're a small office, um, the industry partnerships were really critical to the on-time completion of the project. Um, so we couldn't afford maybe architectural grade finishes, so we had to search elsewhere for quality, durable finishes, such as the automotive factories. Um, but the overall effect of these three material palettes creates um, pockets of different spatial densities and a series of overlapping and aligning geometries which um, immerse the visitor in an experience. And in future projects, we're interested in refining and combining some of these material techniques developed in this project um, and move them into larger scale works that would be more permanent installations. So, um Last fall, we were asked to design, and this is very familiar to the students in this work, and I think some of them are featured in the photos, so. Uh, we were asked to design an environment for the University of Mi uh, Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning as part of the Becoming Digital Project, which was a, a large uh, year-long event uh, that was organized by Ellie Abrons and Adam Fury uh, of TEAM, who are uh, some of our fantastic colleagues in Michigan. So, 
As described by the organizers, uh, Becoming Digital was a year-long project that considered the deep changes underway in architecture and visual culture caused by the increasing naturalization of digital technology. Basically, what was at stake is the computer changed us. How did it change us? Uh, and we're, they were looking beyond digital architecture in terms of a style or simply through defined through the use of the computer, but looking more in the way that digital culture has uh, penetrated our everyday lives on a much deeper level. So it's not about um, the tools themselves, but the changes that they've instrumentalized in us. So. Um, the project uh, coincided with the opening of a brand new wing at Taubman College, uh, which was designed by Preston Scott Cohen. And our environment needed to facilitate a variety of functional and aesthetic requirements, uh, serving the Becoming Digital Project, but also other activities during the year. So the Becoming Digital Project uh, happened intermittently, about once a month, once or twice a month, and then uh, the rest of the time, this was furniture just for this large commons area. So. There were some planned events, and a lot of the, but a lot of them would be ad hoc and unscripted, like this impromptu meeting of young faculty on one of the pieces. So the largest space and defining feature of this new wing I was alluding to uh, serves as the school's commons area, but luckily for us, uh, little thought had been given to precisely how the school would use this void. In fact, that's what was referred to. Uh, by the architect in terms of its figuration but, uh, and its uh, role in the building, but also it was a programmatic void. There was no function. Um, our, our furniture was designed as an experiment in occupying this important collective space. So there was an understanding that it would become the heart of the school in some way, but no real roadmap for how that would happen. So we were particularly interested in learning what type of new social interactions could be possible within the commons, um, which arrived with no script or notation, again, describing its use, just a void. And we were asked to generate a furniture-like system. Um, there's enough architects in the room to know, to be familiar with the brief we got, which was um, furniture that could do anything or everything on a modest budget, um, from hosting workshops to lectures to bringing a welcoming environment for gathering relaxing. It had to do it all, and we had a month. So rather than develop prototypical tables or chairs, uh, which kind of arrive with uh, an idea of how to use them, everyone knows what to do with a chair, we began by developing some general performance rules and criteria for the environment. So it needed to be modular. Um, it needed to be movable, but not too easily movable. It needed to accommodate formal and informal gatherings of all types, so workshops, lectures, roundtable discussions, casual interactions. And the drawings we developed at this stage were not prescriptive, that is to say that they weren't plans of the actual space, but rather predictive. They kind of anticipated and speculated on future use rather than delineating static arrangements that would be fixed in space. Um, so I think that there's definitely here a connection with the way inter we approached intermission as well, where we were kind of modeling scenarios, not really trying to fix down a, a precise plan. So we prefer to design possibilities in our work rather than outcomes. That's obvious between the last project and this. And we generated a designed ambiguity within the work, generally achieved through a systematic approach. So designing flexibility into a system often means that you need to design the system again and again, anticipating possible configurations and checking against set parameters. This is, again, this idea that you can't just defer authorship by saying that it's going to be flexible. In fact, flexible systems take more authorship in a lot of ways. So in the case of the stacks, we realized that we need to create a furniture that's stacked in modules to achieve ideal height. So we really focused on the horizontal plane uh, that could function as benches, stages, tables, and chairs. The modules arose from fabrication and access constraints. So how big of a piece can we actually get into this space? And how big of a piece can we ship? Um, but more importantly, uh, they kind of generate different social bodies at different scales, which we find really fascinating, this idea of a collective. So there's the number of people that can fit in the center of one of these, which is about one. There's the number of people that can sit in one unit. It's about six. Uh, there's the number of people that it takes to move, three to four. So these kind of social bodies are implied by the weight and the kind of uh, parameters of the object, not defined by um, anything ordained from the, the geometry. So first we decided that we wanted to make the space feel less like a furniture arrangement and more like bodies in space. So it couldn't resemble identifiable pieces of furniture. Each encounter and arrangement should feel organized yet casual, formal, and inviting. 
So we wanted to maintain the primacy of the horizontal surface. We did this for two reasons. First of all, the horizontal plane invites occupancy and collectives of people without limiting their orientation or relationship to one another. And second, the project was going to be highly visible from the third level circulation ramp, giving it a unique fifth facade. So this is drone footage from inside the commons, which is large enough to take that drone footage. And uh, it connects two sides of the school and approaching from either side, which are dense with program, this is the first thing you see is looking down into the space. And you can see here there's a pattern system that I'll allude to in a moment, but it flickers in and out of, um, of alignment. We were interested in shifting hierarchical relationships within the audience. So for example, there's no clear discernible front row or back row. It's all a bit ambiguous. There are clear rows within this space. Um, and we wanted to kind of disrupt that relationship. We're very happy to see that faculty and students intermingled through a series in the round conditions of the holes, offsets, and steps. Everyone's kind of finding their little niches. And in other words, the organization of hierarchy of the space was not based on orthographic delineation. We didn't draw it out like you would draw out a plan of this room. Um, but it depended on adjacency, tangency, proximity, and density of objects and bodies in space. And that's really important for us to understand um, how that's operating. So the stacking concept worked quite functionally and aesthetically. We, from the beginning, we really liked that. But structurally, it presented some challenges. The furniture needed to be extremely stable and safe, because it could be occupied by dozens of students, or our colleagues, <laughs> um, at a time. And it needed to be produced extremely quickly. So to accommodate these requirements, uh, we use SIPs, which are structurally insulated panels, um, to construct a series of horizontal surfaces which provided us the strength we needed, yet were light enough to be moved by small groups. Um, working with a local SIPs manufacturer, we were able to get custom profiles produced, reducing our in-house labor. So essentially, SIPs are typically used in um, residential construction or commercial construction where you're concerned about a, a thermal level because they're two layers of OSB or plywood sandwiched around uh, EPS foam. So what that does is it creates a really, really rigid panel, which is typically used in the vertical orientation. Um, but what's great about this is because they usually cut into them to uh, 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 put in outlets or to put in windows, they're used to cutting very precise profiles. So the manufacturer will give you basically any shape you draw. Um, <laughs> In our built work, we're interested in the agency of architects to understand industry processes and propose new uses, functions, and combinations. So when the manufacturer, uh, when we contacted them, they said, well, what kind of R value do you need? And we said, we don't care about the R value, but we actually do care about the R value because the R value determines the thickness. And all we cared about was that thickness to create the kind of ideal uh, seating heights. So we finished the uh, top of the OSB um, with, a, with, a, with a kind of pattern system. So the pattern system actually drew on the themes from the larger Becoming Digital project. We wanted to generate an environment that felt like you were occupying a digital drawing. It has the tectonic reality with these primitive shapes, uh, but this is overlaid with traces of primitive, primitive drawing, uh, digital drawing. So there's the shape, the line, and the fill. That's like something straight out of Illustrator. And we developed an offset patterning script which provided pattern variations and gave, gave some much needed color the white common space. So we chose to expose the OSB and the sandwich so that it was understood like what this actually thing was constructed of. But then we developed this graphic pattern system that actually created correspondence between the parts. So no matter how you stack them, they kind of seem to fit together. So there's no correct or incorrect way to organize the pieces, but there are moments of alignment that suggest certain pairings. And when viewed from above, the patterns flicker in and out of alignment. So one benefit of doing this project is that we've actually been able to observe it in the building and its kind of life throughout the year. And we've been really delighted with the way that students use it. And recently we've started to do these post-occupancy drawings that are better than what we could have imagined. So we never could have produced a drawing like the drawing on the right before we built the project. But in documenting these, we've started to learn how uh, people, people use and perform within the space. And it's pretty fantastic. So it's really nice actually to have this drawing come last. This is students in a workshop, and I just, I love this. Like, the, the project is incomplete without all the kind of ephemera, and I never would have thought it would accommodate someone in the center so nicely. So, for us, the legacy of this entire project, this endeavor, is actually in this slide. 
So this is an illustration of some of the dozens of case studies provided at the SIPS website. So this is the manufacturer's website. Um, and what they're trying to do is demonstrate here all the potential uses for the product. Pro uh, product. So the product is really simple. It's right off the shelf. You can use it to make almost anything. It's a rigid surface sandwich product. But if you look, every project on here is almost completely identical. It's just a litany of residential, traditional architectures or small scale commercial, except for this, <laughs> this glowing weird stack. Um, and so we're really uh, excited to kind of feed back into the catalog and to maybe kind of push back into all the kind of conventions that have been folded onto this product. And this kind of disruption we see as our kind of central role as architects. So users uh, of, the, of the commons have commented that it feels like being in a Rhino model, so that's a success. Um, and we achieved these uh, exaggerated effects with the floating extruded presentation drum, which was also part of the project, and this glowing digital light that we put on. It's like, a, what's the thing? Ground effects on cars, if you hot rod around. Um, so these are, we believe that these two projects are kind of set up really fruitful things that we can do beyond the installation and furniture level. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly talk about um, some, after the, following these two built projects, I'm gonna briefly talk about some work in progress. Um, so the next couple projects are a little bit more architectural, so to speak, um, depending on how you might define that. And while the practice has primarily focused on exhibition for the last few years, um, we're currently working on a variety of residential projects from the scale of a weekend retreat to a larger villa, all for one client. They're currently in schematic design, and these projects are actually located in upstate New York. So the houses are extensions of part-to-part -part and part-to-whole relationship studies we've been conducting with software, experimenting with the legibility of individual forms and the complex relationships possible with a set of primitive parts. So obviously, this owes its kind of formal investigation to uh, things like the furniture project I just showed. And each example here is actually a study that's produced in Python based on a basic growth algorithm. So the grammar of these abstract studies includes a series of primitive shapes. You have circles, you have squares, you have triangles, aggregated according to basic rule sets. So the architectural implication for these studies are obvious, as we see architecture as an orchestration and organization of parts rather than the superimposition of a specific. In the design of a weekend retreat for the couple, for example, the client suggested a complex and intense set of public-private relationships. So they wanted this retreat, but they also wanted to host a music festival at it. They have a lot of different requirements. And it became clear that we need to consider carefully the legibility of each public and private domain. So as such, the project began with a series of these generative organizational studies conducted in, in 2D at first, considering the formal and, uh, and informal aggregations of identifiable primitive shapes that would later become basic program components in these collective forms. So when translated into 3D, we began experimenting with the legibility of these shapes and their hierarchy within the composition. And the studies became the basis for two house proposals currently in progress, the weekend cabin and uh, which plays with the legibility game between roof skylights, chimneys, and its subtle but highly modulated envelope. So you can see here that it is still composed of a series of primitive parts, but by, um, by using things like the roof and the chimney to basically start to obscure how that's happening in elevation, you get this weird, almost like hayduck type elevation, um, and you get a very kind of um, ambiguous interior. Um, and this is a larger villa that we're, that's designed to operate as a series of individual cabins. So it looks like one giant house, but it's actually three different houses in one. And it hosts everything in one kind of collective form. And for us, these projects represent the early stages of how the language and formal experimentation that's been part of our installation work might become more permanent in its, uh, as a proposal. And we were recently very thrilled to have several of these studies alongside um, several other works from Outpost Office uh, shown at the Inscriptions Show, which was uh, hosted at Harvard's uh, Graduate School of Design, curated by Andrew Holder and K. Michael Hayes. And we show this because the appearance of uh, the work in the show has us rethinking the series of studies, particularly its relationship to a search for new origins, which is part of the curatorial statement that Hayes and Holder supply, which we think is probably exactly what it is, um, particularly in terms of our practice establishing a design approach and, uh, and identity.
Primitive Ring uh, is a proposal for an outdoor amphitheater at the campus of Ragdale Foundation, a nonprofit artist community located on a country estate of the architect um, Howard Van Doren Shaw. Uh, Ragdale uh, offers nearly 200 residences and fellowships annually to creative professionals of all types, making it one of the largest interdisciplinary artist communities um, in the U.S. Ragdale residents um, represent a cross-section of ages, cultures, experiences, and mediums. So each year the foundation hosts a design competition, this was our entrance to the competition, um, to, to construct a temporary summer pavilion on its grounds. So the pavilion is sited on the same location where Doran Shaw originally constructed a ringed amphitheater for members of his own family to perform in, um, as you can see from 1914 on the right. So our proposal, um, entitled A Primitive Ring, um, is embedded with formal structures and motifs of, original ring, of the original ring, rendered in a moment of collapse, to offer performers and spectators an environment oscillating between the natural and unnatural, the permanent and the temporary, um, and the formal and the spontaneous. Inspired by the striking motif of the arched threshold of the 19th century, um, Chicago architect Van Doren Shaw's uh, original ragdoll ring, our primitive ring is composed of several large monolithic obelisks supporting thin, incomplete lintel encircling the lawn and creating a space for gathering and performance. The primitive ring um, arrays the original ragdoll ring's proscenium arch radially around the site. The individual obelisk um, elements straddle an uncanny relationship between column and stone, embodying the natural and artificial motifs of the architect's arts and crafts work um, filled with asymmetrical picturesque compositions. Um, primitive rain is caught between construction and collapse, between formal performance and improvisa improvisational spontaneity, between heavy and light. Um, during our research trip to the site, we were intrigued by performers who were moving like, seamlessly um, between the stage and the crowd, so sort of dancing uh, within the audience. Um, and last year, the performance was not limited to the formal stage provided by um, the winning team, our, some of our colleagues um, called team, um, but uh, also extended across the entire lawn. So we saw the previous performance and kind of were inspired by that. So our proposal the next year um, followed suit by providing a formal um, space, but also designating kind of clearing or space for spectators, again, trying to blur the audience between um, blur the boundary between audience and performer. So it was our hope that this unconventional setting um, would inspire the residents um, at, who stay at Ragdale each spring. So in the, inside the ring, guests could gather in um, informal clusters using blankets or um, even on some of the horizontal pieces which had fallen. Um, and guests inside the ring would be part of the event, immersed as the part of the backdrop. Entry into and out of the ring is also non-hierarchical, so people can move in and out through the fragments of the ring as they wish. Unlike the original ring, which designated a kind of clear processional route, um, each visitor could move in and out as they wished throughout the performance. So the language of the prim primitive ring evokes the stereotomic weight of carved stones, but these large monoliths actually show um, are actually hollow structures clad with um, very lightweight veneer of radius bending plywood. The relevance of using wood in this project is twofold. Um, first, the wood detailing and wooden decorative elements are characteristic of the arts and crafts movement um, and featured in many of the architect Van Doren Shaw's um, original works. Um, and second, the, wood, the thin wood veneer construction creates a scene which is something like the temporality of a scenographic backdrop um, and also the heaviness of an ancient ruin because it appears like a monolith. Um, yet its light color would contrast a saturated green setting, um, which is a grassy space with lots of trees. So primitive ring would sit near um, the barn on Ragdale and in a low clearing. Although fragmented, the ring feels um, complete in elevation, offering a sense of enclosure to the lawn um, through the playful thresholds and tilted obelisks for performance. Um, and, and so this is the last of our design proposals. Um, this was a proposal, of course, which we didn't win the competition, but I think very often, as you know, um, those are almost as useful or sometimes more useful um, than the competitions you do win. So it's always uh, kind of something where we're learning from our past, um, past projects. Um, and then the final um, 
thing that we're going to talk about is not a built project or even specifically a kind of formal proposal for architecture, um, but it's in the spirit of dispersed models of architectural production, which we're more and more interested in. Um, and so we recently created a podcast about architecture, which is called um, Site Visit. I think we're also both educators in architecture, and so we're always looking for um, ways to reach new audiences, whether they be our students or um, people on the street or family members who are not architects, um, we're always interested in how we can better communicate architectural ideas um, to the world. And so as one of our first guests on the um, podcast, John McMorrow, pointed out in our second episode, however, um, the format is tragically flawed and insufficient. How do you make a podcast about architecture? Um, we, we're working on it. Um, so for us, though, the, the, the conversation um, or the discourse is the actual subject. Um, the architecture is just a foil for a far more relevant topic, which is the way that the guest sees, interprets, and engages with the built environment. Um, the project is casually serious, and we ask our guests to pick a site of their choice, and then we visit it together, and then we talk about it. Um, so we see each episode as a form of collaboration as well, um, and it's also even produced by one of our students, Matthew Schulman, who's here in the audience today. Um, <laughs> So as much as the episode is about the chosen site, we believe that we really could continue to visit one site over and over with a new guest, and there would be a completely um, new interpretation of that site by the visitor. So inevitably, the conversation turns um, to their practice and so how it might relate from the site that they've chosen um, to the way that they talk about it. So the only rule is that the architect is, or the visitor is not allowed to choose a project which they designed. We're much more interested in uh, what they think about a project which someone else designed or that no one designed. Um, so from John McMurrow's interest in musical and performance, we went to see, we went to, see a, we went to the theater with him. Um, so he has a, um, he's interested in performance as a logistical problem, which is similar to an architectural proposition. Um, to Kelly Bear, one of our other um, guests, who was interested in the Chicago underground pedway, a kind of complex of underground um, pathways, um, and its relationship to um, Bear Ballet's research on the line. Um, to Ellie Abrams, um, interest in camp and material as image um, in the visual and sensorial cacophony that is um, Menard's Home Improvement, so a really large Midwestern um, big box store. Um, she found inspiration there and, and got us to fall in love with it as well. Um, so each episode has given us insight into some of how our peers view the world. Um, it is in this completeness, that in this expansiveness of intellectual life of the architect um, that we're most interested in. So simply put, it's a show about architecture everywhere. And we're in excited about this project, um, specifically about the kind of possible audiences um, for site visit, and precisely because it's not about architecture itself, um, or it is about architecture, it's not about its production, um, but it's about its impact in the world. And so this project aligns with conversations we often have about how to bring architecture to a broader audience. Um, so we have no clear way yet to measure the percentage of our audience member that are architects or not architects, but we believe that by using the format of podcasting, um, one which is not native to, to architecture itself, like drawing would be very native or model building would be very native, um, this might not be, but um, we get kind of caught up in the cult of image. Uh, so we're interested and in, in we believe that we could produce content which is consumed um, by more unpredictable audiences and, and hopefully bring a, um, a kind of new voice and new perspective to it. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> we'd be very happy to answer any questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation and the project that you showed us. Uh, so my question is, uh, the majority of your project that you show, they some kind of involve uh, performance part. So what do you like most about this or why you do this is just having fun with design or interaction with public or something else? Thank you for the question. Yeah, so I think we've been interested in in performance. I hadn't actually really. I see now that they're all <laughs> that they're really all about uh, that they're really all about performance. Although I don't think that we had ever really used that. I think we had been thinking a lot about engagement, and I think performance is a way uh, is another um, way of engagement and to think about activity 
um, both kind of mental activity but also physical activity. So I think we're interested in um, getting people to move, <laughs> to move physically through a space, on an object, near an object, and a lot of those themes are themes of performance, whether or not we maybe thought in that kind of like one-to-one -one before. Um, but it's true, it kind of worked for that project example using that metaphor, almost like using performance as a metaphor um, because um, theaters, the design of theaters, for example, is such a quintessential architectural um, typology, and I think we're also really interested in typology, and so how um, a theater might be used in a different way um, to kind of break it apart and make it less formal. We're also very interested in kind of informality and um, creating spaces which are very welcoming to all people, um, whether they are architects or not, or old or young or whatever it might be. Um, and so I think, again, like performance is just a kind of maybe a good format for thinking about um, invi in, an invitation to participate. Thank you, Eric and Ashley. Thank you for so fantastic lecture. And I was very wondering about how you manage, um, how your expectation of um, future processes, and uh, you also analyze it, the result of your work, and how is, um, 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 I don't know, basic difference between your your design expectation and, and some yeah, real result or what is surprised your real life. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful question. I think that um, I actually might want to just dovetail a little based on the, the last response, this question of performance, which I really appreciate that question because um, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's definitely uh, a big part of this. I think that um, a big shift for us is that, you know, in the last year we've built, quote unquote, two projects, and while they're very modest uh, and um, a very small scale, I think that we've had to really quickly see how our projects perform in the world. And I think that paper architecture is great, but there comes a point when it begins to become hyper myopic and it just becomes a kind of formal game. And I think what I've been really encouraged by over the last year is seeing how certain formal moves can inform the behavior and the way in which a project performs in reality. And that actually has me even more confident um, in the approach um, where there is a kind of uh, an approach to basically creating a project which alienates from expectations. So for example, creating furniture that doesn't look like furniture at all, but at the same time encoding it with an idea about how you might read it. So the primitive forms allow correspondence between pieces to be very, very easy to understand. Um, so I think what I'm most excited about is the way that we've been able to actually watch the work perform in the world and watch it enlivened by people. I think the big challenge when we're thinking about the housing projects is these aren't going to move. <laughs> so like, how do you kind of keep that liveliness happening? And I think um, it's something we're really trying to, to, to think about. But that, for me, is the thing I'm actually most excited about. It terrifies me, and I think that's why it's going to be fantastic, is trying to decide you know, when you can't lean on flexibility and movement, how can you still create this level of performance, this, this level of like an architecture that unfolds. So, I don't know. Yeah, I think also just, that was <coughs> great for kind of the conceptual and just thinking also just about the kind of pragmatics of the office. I think we're like in a position now where we're like to take on these projects, which these two projects, two in one year, so it was like very quick turnaround, like kind of two to three months for each project. Um, and so I think we're very interested in like more longer term projects, which might be more typical in an architecture firm. Um, I think we kind of want to always keep that mix of things which turn around very quickly because we're a bit impatient. <laughs> um, but then also like the you know house project, which we've been working on off and on now for an entire year because you actually have the time and the space to 
um, think about it, reflect on it, you know, make a plan, come back to it a month later, reassess, reevaluate your own work, because that's a really like valuable part of the design process is actually sometimes doing things really quickly just to s test and see what happens, and then other times having projects where you can actually reflect or have long spans where you're maybe not working on that project. Anybody else? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question about the project that you had early in your presentation. Um, I think it's, it was about the American suburbs, housing. Um, <clears throat> uh, you had a very representative picture there of having this pink house models placed in the sand. Uh, I think it's uh, a very good representation of typical American lifestyle of having your home as a castle of this outpost. And for Ukrainian tradition, it's very uh, typical as well. Uh, so my question is, I just want to clarify, was it the main issue you were dealing with in your design? Uh, or you had some other um, maybe idea to it? Thank you. Yes, that, that was the main idea. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, I often, um, I often sometimes call the suburbs like our greatest American export, like, because it's not only an American, and we may not have invented it, but in some ways we kind of perfected this very awful planning system. Um, but but it's it happens all over the world and in different places and and I have seen examples even here in Ukraine and, and sometimes it kind of comes spontaneously and sometimes it's through the influence of of other neighbors, um, so yes it was um, it was also meant to be a kind of critique and to kind of shock um, shock people in a way this kind of giant mass. Uh, this kind of question, like, what if you just sort of scooped up all these houses and shoved them together and you lived like that? And in a way, it was meant to not, it was a serious design proposal, but it was also a little, like, sort of ironic or satirical to really have people questioning exactly what they're doing. Because one of my uh, ideas was that uh, if, you, if we're continuing to go down this path of more and more fortification, more and more castle-like, um, houses, you know, maybe this is just where we end up in this kind of megalith mono uh, house that we're all living together, but each has its very, very own strict territory. Um, so it was a, almost a kind of warning um, and, and meant to kind of grab people's attention and, and to reconsider and just to kind of play on that. Even the sand table, it's almost like kind of child's toys, like building blocks where you're building up your kind of future imaginary house. And so it was almost a kind of play on you know, build up your future imaginary castle um, as a, yeah, as a kind of provocation. But you're exactly right, yeah. No, 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 no. Um, you are practicing, but you're also teaching. So in Ukraine, usually it's or, or. So how it works, and does it help you or give you some uh, impulse of how it works? Uh, yes, so we're still figuring it out. Um, but, it, but it's actually a great, you know, in the, in the US, we have great many models of this kind of practice and teaching. Actually, like some of the architecture firms which we admire most, um, they're also teaching. And I think there's good reasons for that. Um, I think, one, you're surrounded by um, lots of great influences, our, our students, who are always kind of bringing um, new ideas, new perspectives, a lot of energy. Um, and so that's really helpful, I think. You can sometimes sort of test out things in a studio or in a classroom. Um, we don't ever, there's like a kind of boundary that you want to have. We don't ever sort of take a project in from the office and give it to the students, but we might think about like a theme or a topic that we're interested um, and then kind of propose that as, a, as an idea to students, which then they can kind of build on and, and work off. I think it's a kind of sort of a shared expertise um, that we're trying to build. I think that's one one aspect. I think the other is that 
um, teaching, you have such great colleagues also. So we have many other great colleagues who are also trying to balance teaching and practice. Um, and so I think we also learn a lot from them. Um, however, it's difficult. I think it's why we've been focusing more on shorter projects um, because it's been it's the kind of timeline that we're able to do. But I think now um, we're balancing things a bit better and, and would like to move to longer term projects. Yeah, no, and uh, I think that just one thing I wanted to note is, I mean, we we have like the best job in the world. I mean, because like to teaching uh, architecture, like just from a pragmatic sense, like basically we can uh, work and choose the work we want to work on and do these research projects, which admittedly we don't make a lot from because we can financially support ourselves through teaching. So there's a certain pragmatism to doing it, but it's more what Ashley is talking about in terms of the kind of like environment that we're thrust into, the kind of inspiring students, the inspiring colleagues that keep uh, our energy going. And I think also the this is uh, kind of inseparable within our uh, practice because its its foundations are in two projects. The project that Ashley showed, the um, defense architecture, and then the following year, my fellowship project, which I showed a little bit at the beginning about collections. Um, and in each case, we had to kind of take a very strong position and develop a research project that became, that then became really foundational to the practice. So you can't like pull the threads apart. It's so sutured together. And so if we were to leave teaching or to stop practicing, like it's just, it's, it's kind of impossible to imagine at this point. It's one thing. Maybe it's, maybe it's also the kind of, not impatience, but a desire for variety. Maybe we don't, you know, I don't want to say I get bored, but I get bored if I'm doing the same thing every day. Okay, I'll admit it. I get very bored if I'm doing the same thing every day. And so um, with teaching, even just the schedule, you're teaching one day, you're in the office the next day. Like every day, no two days are ever the same. And there's like a really nice rhythm to the kind of academic year that I think keeps us very sane. Uh, I'm very excited with the lecture, and I am really very grateful that we see not only the projects of your work, of your teaching, the results, but also your interest, and you stress as well, uh, the interest in Ukraine, that's the participation in the competition. So for us, for me, it's a um, very great support that the, that Architects from outside of Ukraine, uh, from abroad as well, participate in. So it's open to the world. Um, from your approaches that I've seen uh, in, in your teaching and about the investigations of the, in the projects, um, I'm very interested in the um, types of analysis that you use, the methods of the analysis that you use in the simple forms, simple geometry. So the question, I understand why, but the question is what receives the advantage, the geometry or the form, in the, uh, in, and the form or the function that you put or connect? It's a really great question, and uh, I think that um, there is uh, there is a degree of analysis happening, but I think it's um, much more informal than you would expect to happen. Let's say if you had an architecture, uh, let's say we have a residential project and we do an analysis of the site and we do analysis of circulation, we do analysis of program, etc. So. One thing is that we've probably been able to issue questions of analysis because the projects haven't been asked to perform that complicated tasks. I mean, really, like their um, their installations, and so they're 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 not burdened with as much as you would expect from the architectural project. I think for us, models have become increasingly important because in the models, what we try to do is you'll notice maybe in the intermission model, for example. The digital model we produced, it actually had um, entourage in it, it had people in it, it had, uh, it had an extremely high level of detail. 
um, because we tried to use the model to anticipate the way that these things will be used. So uh, modeling these scenarios that we're talking about, it's almost more like developing a kind of set design and then testing it. And we can only really speculate on how people will, will, will operate and will use the space. Um, but I think within the system, there is some analysis in terms of, so for example, function for the furniture. Function just came down to the fact that to sit, you need a surface that's 18 inches high. That's it. So like that is the only performance criteria. So we do develop really rigid performance criteria. Or for example, the furniture, there was an entire structural analysis into whether it would tip or not, right? So deciding uh, exactly how far the forms can cantilever, deciding how many stacks and configurations are possible, happened through a series of structural models where we started to look at the way that they would perform. Um, so there's performance criteria happening in the background, but we don't foreground it because for us that's not really uh, of, int of primary interest. What's of primary interest um, is um, developing forms that maybe start to allow you to escape from expectations. So again, if a chair is provided, a chair will be used the way you expect a chair to be used. But if something that's foreign, something that doesn't elicit its function, something that doesn't deliver a message into what it is, invites curiosity, it invites a kind of estrangement from the object, and it allows there to be a kind of suspension of normal behavior. Um, and it might be very subtle, like the fact that you sit inside of a donut instead of outside of a donut, but to us this is absolutely consequential um, because it's fundamentally about the relationship that started to be formed between the person and the object, which in architecture is all you can really ask for, right, is to develop a kind of new, a new relationship to your environment. So if, there's a seek, if we're seeking novelty, the novelty is not in the form because everyone's seen a square and everyone's seen a circle. The novelty is the way in which the person engages that thing. And that, for us, is the kind of magic. That's the alchemy of architecture. It's not about a form that you look at and say, oh, that's a new form. It's about encountering an object in a, in a new way. But I love this question. I think that's all, yeah, I think. Um, so thank you guys. <laughs>